Uh, good evening and welcome everyone to Gallery Espace. I took this exhibition walkthrough with uh, Valay and with uh, Premjish. Uh, Cloud Pruning, this is Valay's uh, debut solo with Gallery Espace. And uh, we are very happy to have all these works. Uh, you know, they, these works constitute a new direction in his practice. And uh, as I'm sure he will speak to Premjish about, Premjish, of course, is, uh, is a former uh, professor, he, he, a former academician. Uh, he's an art uh, historian, an art writer, a curator. And uh, we are very happy to have him speak and uh, tell us about the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gargi. And thank you, Renuji, for having us here. And thank you all. It's quite valuable, like we were discussing. We see the reducing number of people coming for walkthroughs. And it's an alarming scenario. So it's quite valuable that all of you came today uh, and taking out your time for this. Congratulations on thank your you. solo show, the debut solo show. Thank you. And I'm here to discuss what Gargi mentioned, which I also saw on the website, the new direction in Wale's practice. And it's quite an interesting turn that the practice has taken. And one striking feature of this exhibition for me was the intimacy, the poetry of it, the emotional climate of melancholia, a very poetic, intimate melancholia that one gets invited to attend, view it. And the exhibition, uh, one of the rare moments uh, where the space and the artworks also invite you to come and tend to it, come and engage with it. And uh, to begin with also Wale's text. I don't know how many of you have read it, it's quite beautiful. And also the poetry. Uh, recitation that is there below the floor uh, on the basement that's also uh, there on the wall also quite evocative there's a yearning there to reach out there's a proclamation there's a, also a declaration that's there uh, not only talking about what you're feeling but also imagining newer possibilities taking us through a walk that's also there. So it's quite an invite in that way that engages with various possibilities. And the title itself is quite poetic that way. The idea of pruning, as we know, is trimming, shaping things. And here, what you are pruning are the clouds. So shall we start with the title and try to understand why the cloud pruning? Sure. What is it about? The act of pruning, artistically, what it means. So, um, I mean, it's, it, the title itself is a uh, Japanese technique, wherein uh, it's called kiwaki, and where hedges are trimmed to seem to look like clouds. Very often, some of them almost look like ugly lollipops. But, um, here, the title for me was more uh, about um, pruning as an act, which um, not only is cutting off excess sort of stems, but also then facilitates further growth. So clouds which you otherwise cannot imagine you would ever be able to prune, for me, were things about blockages, about um, you know dark thoughts that sort of bring you down and um, just by the act of trying to remove them um, or prune them there was some access to light uh, to sort of come in and help you clear your vision and um, go forward so that was essentially the uh, the idea of the the title um, you know, to something which is a gardening uh, process but um, which is also very much linked to my practice now. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> You're interesting because uh, what I see also in the exhibition 
is this reference to various processes, like pruning is one of them. Gardening, again, something more important that also resonates with the entire work, uh, works that are there. Uh, the idea of nurturing, the idea of caregiving, also shaping but not intruding, not invading completely or imposing yourself completely onto something. It's also related for me with the idea of art making itself, artistic identity also. And before we also engage with a lot of these works that are here on this floor and ground floor, uh, I would also like to engage with these references that you're drawing, like the Japanese term you used. But even in the text, even in the poetry, and many of the writings and your practice revolves around a lot of references, whether they are taken or inspired from literature, from psychoanalysis, or from artistic processes. So would you like to also talk about some key writers, sure. some key theorists, who are also an inspiration for the show? Sure. So um, in terms of lit uh, literally references, <coughs> there's um, Virginia Woolf, um, whose uh, you know, stream of consciousness uh, technique and also um, her book of the waves which was more of a, a play poem which was breaking away in some ways from genres um, and talking about her own mental health and um, you know which then in the, in, in the end leads to far darker areas of her committing suicide. Um, that was one of the references which um, sort of really uh, sort of came to me um, in terms of psychoanalysis there you know there's loads of Freudian Lacanian sort of uh, references of um, trying to go back to the womb and that yearning for um, you know come getting into a more comfortable position wherein um, you'll see that in the bathtub work um, when you're entering into that sort of space um, you know, of comfort. And yet, um, there are, uh, once you're out of the womb, there's no going back. So uh, there's only that comfort in death that you see. So uh, those references are there. There's a lot of other um, references to labyrinths mm. which uh, come in. And um, there's Robert Frost. There's tons of uh, literary references which have come in and precipitated through um, my education uh, in English literature. So uh, a lot of it had sort of, this has been like a burst in some ways of a lot of references coming uh, mm. forth. Um, yeah. For, for me, what is uh, crucial, the bedrock of the exhibition is the close relation between art and psychoanalysis, uh, which is also rarely now gets discussed in the Indian context and the, uh, addressed in the Indian context too. And as we know from the surrealist onwards, art and psychoanalysis have a very close connection. And one of the, but uh, that was trying to implement certain theoretical postulates of psychoanalysis, like automated drawing and all that stuff. But psychoanalysis also as a recuperative healing device, as a tool to heal, has been also taken up by artists like uh, Louis Bourgeois in her life, in her practice, mm -hmm. psychoanalysis has played a huge impact. And art itself, art as a healing, art as a coping mechanism, especially in the context of the depression also, you talk about. So how do you uh, also engage with that? Uh, do you agree that art has a healing possibility? Art has a therapeutic potential? It does, um, because while I was, you know, especially when we speak about the pandemic being like a major thing that pushed a lot of um, these issues out. Um, it has, I mean, I call it like this show being like a, a maha purge, uh, wherein I have, you know, sort of tried to channel my anxieties and issues with dealing with what directions to take my work in, whether, or be it work or also spiritually, where I'm going, um, it, it has been a great way of 
sort of, you know, saying that, okay, whether it is people sort of viewing me in a gestaltic way of just one body of work of just one person, um, it's been it's been a great way to be able to um, sort of you know display and express myself um, through this show of 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 saying that you know um, um, these are also parts of me that I you know I'm just not this one person I'm so many people and um, it's been a great way to be able to channel that out in several ways um, and yes I mean after having produce the body of work. I mean, it does feel far lighter um, to have expressed this out, so. Yeah. yeah. But let's also engage with the COVID pandemic moment and uh, your response, the bodily somatic response to it. Because I think that is also very crucial in the foundation, the formation of this exhibition. Uh, you also refer to the solitary walks you took and the inspiration, the agony of in isolation that all of us faced in the pandemic that has quite pivotal in the formation of this exhibition. So how long did it take for you to create all this and um, what was the journey like? So I mean the seeds were sort of sown essentially during the first wave um, when I still had, you know, I was still uh, luckily locked in with my partner and we didn't thankfully kill each other, but um, so, but that still was a space in which, um, you know, I was very, there were a lot of uncertainties at that point about um, not being able to access a studio space and also of where, um, you know, I mean, people don't talk about it a lot, but the art world is really, um, even though I'm really privileged, um, uh, it is really this this funny little uh, flux where there's just tons of uncertainties there, and there was this body of work that I produced because of the um, you know uh, cut, uh, cut down on the supply chain, uh, food supply chain especially. I was literally emptying my masala dabbas and trying to grow every single little uh, you know seed that was there. And there was a body of work that I produced then, which was called Seeds for an Uncertain Future. So um, it was on photographic, overexposed photographic papers, which were lying around for years together in my folio. I had nothing else except for that and some photographic inks and um, uh, waterproof inks. And I sort of was started to document the whole process of these seeds and growing them, yet not knowing whether um, you know these these <coughs> seeds will really grow into anything mature uh, and plants and that, and also the same with my own sort of um, practice as to where it would go further on from there. So it had started from there, and then during the second wave, there were travel sort of uh, restrictions. I was away. And suddenly, you know, a lot of self-doubt started to creep in. And, you know, I mean, whether what I'm doing is the right thing, do you think the career sort of choices that I made were the right ones? And um, it started to, you know, sort of really mess with my head. And um, it, that's, that's how I kind of was moving into these. Uh, luckily, once things started easing out, I would go for these walks and um, on a daily basis, that's the first thing I do. Um, I take my dogs for a walk in the morning. I don't sort of switch on my phone. It's cut away from the world and you know, it's just the walks. And that's when um, I discovered a lot of things on, um, you know, on my walks on Central, South Central Ridge, um, you know, sort of these really motley sort of group of characters and symbols which were there on these walks which started to sort of speak to me and I kind of responded to them um, you know and I thought that while I'm trying to look at directions I think maybe the search for a direction itself could be an artistic expression um, which is how the sort of body of work sort of um, emerged so a few of them started off last year 
and um, I'm not going to lie, but a lot of them were literally three months before like, the show. Like all of that us. That sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. Yeah. The two things. Uh, one, now we know when not to call him. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was looking at the exhibition, um, which uh, uh, for me there are three thematics, three or four thematics, or body of works that emerge. One group that we see here, the floral. The flowers that are scaled up, which is also related to I, I know I don't know if you know, uh, Wale has a keen interest in the botanical, in the idea of gardening, and here the flowers uh, they're very interestingly called as paper, paper uh, flowers, paper flowers. Bougain they are bougainvillea flowers, as you know, but they are scaled up, they are scaled up, and here also, and there uh, we have another version of it. Where, where you can see them, uh, small, in the small versions, uh, in its stages of decomposition. So would you like to talk about why flowers, why scaled up flowers, and why bougainvillea flowers also? So um, I, I was literally told by my mom that when she was carrying me in her womb, she used to literally have this practice of picking flowers from the garden and she'd make these little veinies and wear it in her hair. And uh, lo and behold, while I grew up, my absolute fascination and obsession with flowers. But um, while the, my earlier body of work has essentially sort of dealt with A, scaling them up to look at the larger pictures of uh, habitat destruction and species in extinction, um, you know, and sort of to draw an audience to look at these larger uh, topics. Um, this particular show has been more of an interior journey. So um, I was responding to and, you know, sort of projecting a lot of things which were going in my own head. So uh, these particular flowers, I mean, as you know, bougainvilleas, they absolutely thrive in arid um, areas where you don't need a lot of resources in terms of water and they're extremely fragile yet therefore they're called paper flowers. Uh, for me they are representative of our dreams and you know uh, <clears throat> while we're small everything seems really scaled up. Our dreams are massive. We want to sort of you know uh, people want to sort of be astronauts and you know they're, they're these massive dreams and yet not all of them come to fruition, you know. So um, these to me are like those dreams that you, they're frozen in time. They're all vivid on the, on the trees in these really vivid colors. And then you come to a body of work over there where it's scaled down to its actual size. And, um, you know, you, you trample over them and uh, they sort of decay and yet, um, you must not stop dreaming because, um, yeah. So that's that's where this particular um, body of sort of work comes from. So when I started the introduction, I said uh, this is a very curious and important exhibition for me, uh, uh, as we were also discussing previously a few days back, because it's a it's quite uh, there's quite a lot of inviting going on here. But what I find fascinating is the duality, the dialectics that play here is, if you look at the two texts that are there, one is quite confessional, the poetry has, it's quite declarative. The confessional is quite vulnerable in that way and the other one is also very seductive. It's like luring you to go out, to march out, to look at the clouds, engage with them. Here again in this floor we see the blooming, we see the decay. So there are a lot of dialectics that play out. There's a journey that is inwards, but there's a pathway yeah. that is also created outwards, that is symbolic of the outward journey, which many of you will see here. So uh, let's go down, and, and meanwhile, you can take a look at this work. And this is the work which we were talking about, <coughs> which goes, which engages with the various facets and uh, this, these are impressions which you have done, the bougainvillea flowers. So some of them are um, literally pressed um, bougainvillea flowers 
And um, there are also sort of markings to try and uh, mimic the soil over there. Um, yeah, and most of the, these are all in stoneware, uh, made in stoneware clay, mm -hmm. and uh, fired and then painted with uh, polyurethane prints, the same that you see on the uh, large works. Yeah. yeah, so when I said uh, the exhibition has some key themes, some key motives, floral or flowers uh, are one of them. Pathways are, again, something very important for us to engage with. Uh, pathway as an image is something which is very unique and I am seeing it for the first time. Like I've seen this in paintings a lot, but pathway as a sculptural installation, the, the image of the pathway is something very unique in the sculptural realm for the first time. And a lot of Valais practice in this exhibition is taking the idea of an image, whether they are the image of the pathway, whether they are the image of the labyrinth. And we will engage with all of that. And what he has created internally in the exhibition is also a pathway, a labyrinth. And it's also very, very consciously done. So let's walk to understand the image of walking with Wale here. Uh, there's a very interesting book, uh, which is also translated to English. It's called The Philosophy of Walking, which also used to be, a, a, what you call, I used to refer it to my students because uh, when I was teaching about the processes of practice, artistic practice, seeing, hearing, uh, and walking, these were some of the important techniques of an artistic practice. The philosophy of walk talks about various strategies of the idea of walk. Not only walking in the way we walk, but running, but also wandering, drifting. All of these are important aspects of walking. And there is an entire artistic movement, if you know, that has revolved around the idea of walking, drifting, in France, which is uh, led by the situationists an international uh, or a group of Marxist artists who engaged with city very closely by walking through the city, by drifting through the city, by hoping onto different parts of the city. And Valais' engagement here is again about walking. And walking again was an important philosophical concept in the 18th, 19th century Europe. Uh, we were discussing about Nietzsche uh, who has written extensively on the idea of wandering. And this is also related to the romantic practice of wandering that was associated with the intellectual practice of, in Germany and Austria at that time. So many of you remember the painting, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Forks by Caspar David Friedrich, where the man is standing, but you don't see his face, but he is looking at the sea of forks, and he is taking a break from his walk, his wandering. And here again, I see somebody engaging with that in a sculptural form, in an installation form, or in a two-dimensional form, giving a visuality to the idea of what we see when we walk. And here are the traces of that. And here are what he also calls as the runes, runes as these magical scripts that appear or also something like what you call the tea leaf reading, the leaves that, are, that remains, that offers you a chance to read your future. 
what you're going to be or what is coming for you. So this entire this pathway is quite interesting, quite fascinating and giving it a visual form is uh, very interestingly done. So would you like to tell us what is going on here? What are the different elements that are, you, you have assembled here for us? Um, <clears throat> so predominantly, I mean, it is uh, the wool that's been uh, applied on top of it is uh, looking, try to mimic the texture of the soil. But what you will see is a lot of it is these seed pods, which are of um, Vilaiti kikar. So it's an invasive species now, and um, it came in through Pakistan. And uh, what I found interesting is that you know these were shed by the wind and rain, and they sort of form these patterns. So for me, while I was having these extensive walks in uh, you know around the ridge. Um, it was just, for me, these pathways seem like, you know, old pathways, new pathways. It sort of made me question a lot about the choices that I've made, about Robert Frost's, you know, the road not taken, um, you know, and also sort of made me think about the choices that I've made and trying to look for cues, uh, clues as to where I should go further. So. Very often when you have the rune readings, um, you're trying to look at the past, the future, and also the present, and trying to make on a daily basis these choices. And yet, you don't know whether the choice you're going to make is going to be the right one. So you're always sort of burdened with this uh, thing of making choices all the time. So I mean, there are loads of elements that I could have added in, which I have not added in. Uh, but you know there are playing cards that you very often see thrown on these pathways. There are syringes, there are condom wrappers, there are loads of which. So you you come across a lot of um, elements on, you know, especially during COVID. I, I saw loads of people who were just lying around, and there were some who were, um, you know, looking technically supposed to be looking for jobs, but just whiling away time. Um, in those parks, or lovers who didn't have another space to really uh, meet each other but the park. So uh, the floor sort of had like all these, could have had all these elements, but um, for me, I sort of wanted to distill it to my old sort of um, problem with trying to sort of see which part should, I should take. So. They were originally envisioned as things which would, you know, parts which would crisscross, parts which would fork out. Um, but, you know, I mean, as, as they sort of materialized, I realized that this is uh, how I want it in the end. So there it is. <laughs> so when I also uh, talk about certain visuality that he has created in the exhibition, uh, there's that series of panels also, which also uh, has a very beautiful title. What's it? It's like Bhav Atvi. What does it mean? So Atvi again means forest. So it's synonymous to how we have Bhav Sagar. So um, the you know the the ocean of worldly life. Similarly, uh, so there, for me these um, sort of forest and ocean become. Uh, spaces which are unfathomable, which are, you're trying to sort of find your way around it. And um, the idea of walking and swimming becomes like a really important uh, thing. So also I wanted to, sorry, add something to this particular panels was that um, when you are um, reading runes, you usually cast these, they're almost like dyes and they have there's a lot of Germanic um, origin to them in terms of language. So you cast these runes, and then you sort of see the patterns and formations that are there, and then you interpret them. So uh, whereas here, it was already cast for me by the elements, by monsoons and the wind. Mm. And um, it was not something I, that I had handled. So 
uh, very often we fall into this lazy sort of way of looking at our failures and sort of blaming destiny for you know all that's gone wrong in your life. Uh, whereas there's something called as Purusharth as well that you can also you also can take control over your destiny. So this is where um, while creating the works, I have cast these patterns and I have been responsible for the way the formations are there in this. So, yeah, sorry. So you also have to talk about these panels. Yes. Also, how one should engage with it as a shape, as a structure in the sense there are these fate marks there. So what is this shape? What, uh, again, the botanical reference that you're also using here in this work? So, um, <clears throat> it's a, if you look at it closely, it's a trapezoid sort of shape. And um, which actually comes from, um, I don't know whether uh, many of you have looked at cartoons like Scooby-Doo, et cetera, and there are these um, you know, torches being shown in the night. And this literally is the field of light that I'm trying to capture. Um, and it's the, the leaf references that you see in here, again, from an invasive species. Um, called Parthenians, and they they also called Gajar Gas. They came during the 50s um, when wheat was exported from Mexico and America, and um, so they're the leaves that you see over here. And those footmarks are basically me standing against this sort of wall of what otherwise would have seemed like an um, sort of impenetrable kind of wall. And yet, um, you know, I mean, it is partially permeable. And um, the, there's also an, an inspiration from uh, William Blake's uh, visions of judgment day, and in which you have these souls which are sort of floating almost like these leaves are right now between heaven and hell. So, you know, while I kind of stand against this wall of overgrown foliage. Um, and the, the whole sort of thing is whether I should go forward, whether I should go backwards, I'm trying to sort of navigate through these, um, these worlds. Yeah. So uh, that's what like, makes this exhibition unique for me, is this attempt to create images. It is attempt to form images of these phenomena, of the ways of seeing, of the ways of we experiencing the everyday phenomena around us. And coming to labyrinthine structure, the idea of labyrinth, uh, which all of you are familiar with, but in its original sense, labyrinth originated as a performance rather than an, an architectural structure, which all of you are familiar with. Uh, Ancient Minoans were quite fascinated with labyrinths. And uh, even before existing as a physical structure, it was a performative structure of bo young boys and girls. So it was basically a ritual, a coming of age ritual of boys and girls that was then concretized into an architectural structure. And f even for Romans who comes later after the Greeks, Labyrinth was the perfect epitome of architectural structure where one could come of age. And even in his, uh, what you call, engagement with the idea of labyrinth, one is moving around, one is encountering all these experiences endlessly. There's an eternal recurrence of all this, whether it is depression, whether it is uh, yearning, whether it is meeting, whether it is the joining of lovers, all these emotions, all these experiences are eternally recurring in this labyrinth, which we all are also inhabiting right now. And which also brings me to this installation where, again, almost like the centerpiece, from where we could again break into different areas, uh, which is this structure, a bathtub, where one could enter, if you remove your shoes and all, you could lie down in it, 
and engage with the clouds, which is a perfect tribute to the cloud proning the idea of the central text, or the, the title of the exhibition also. Why did you create this? What was the attempt? Um, so it sort of stemmed from me literally again um, coming across this discarded bathtub and you sort of see it in the drawing over there as there <coughs> as well. And um, I found this, I think it was almost like an, it's I think an 80s style bathtub and fiberglass. And um, I really loved the sort of form of it and I sort of dragged it all the way back home, started planting a lot of um, water uh, plants in it and you know, made, created this water garden. Because for me, um, again, during the pandemic, there was, there was just so much going on around the world. And even you see it now, that's not controllable. There's all this chaos around us. And I thought, for me, this is a small little microcosm that I can create, that I can um, control, that I can sort of make sure that it flourishes. So um, it's, it's just that, you know, I mean, there's only so much on an individual basis that one can create and um, sort of control. And um, so that was my way of, uh, you know, sort of trying to um, deal with that aspect. And so for me, I literally once, um, while, you know, the, the sound of sirens was going on in the background and, um, I, I remember even as a kid this absolute fascination for the first time when um, I got inside a bathtub uh, when I'd gone on a holiday in uh, somewhere in Rajasthan. Ironic because it's a desert, partly. But um, to be able to get inside this um, this bathtub, this container, which is almost womb-like, and um, while you submerge yourself. Um, completely, you know, you're cutting out all the exterior sounds of what's going on and the chaos outside. And for that little moment, you sort of are, you know, cutting out all those, the sounds and you can sort of, you, you know that you're safe in there, in that almost womb-like situation. Um, and that's, that, that's why I kind of um, also was thinking of, um, you know, this whole idea of um, where I sort of mention even in the text, um, this yearning to go back, to, you're born in a lack in this world and this constant yearning to go back to the womb, which is of course not possible. And you can only find that comfort in death. So this in between sort of space of being submerged in a bathtub and um, you know, look at the, the clouds above you. And that's, that's the sort of image that, um, you know, I kind of came to me and that's what I kind of was also, literally did that in that particular illustration that you see. Um, of course, there are art history references, um, you know, of Millier's Ophelia and, um, you know, dealing with madness to whether give in to that or, um, Virginia Woolf's sort of um, um, ultimate suicide by sort of putting stones inside a pocket. Um, and, you know, I sort of title it yet yeah, Swim, which is a more affirmative um, thing rather than drown, um, and which is what I choose to do. <laughs> so that's where the whole idea of the, um, this particular work yeah. came in. What's interesting for me is that uh, you don't foreclose the works into one particular possibility. Like, it's not about drowning. It's about birthing too. It's yeah. about nurturing. Yeah. Like, you have used this bathtub earlier to grow things, right? Water plants, fishes, yeah. and everything in it. And it's also not dying. You are also using it as a birth chamber. It's a womb for you. So this oscillation that is always there in your works, not this, not that, is something that is quite captivating for me. And that is the beauty of this exhibition, as I said earlier, that it's about both the inward and the outward. 
the death and the birthing. In one of the uh, uh, very important uh, or iconic Malayalam movies by G. Aravindan, uh, the the the, trans, the, uh, the 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 title can be translated as Twilight. In Malayalam, it's called Pokuvail. Where the hero is going through uh, an existential crisis and towards the climactic moment, uh, he is having a breakdown and on the bed, and he kind of holds his body in such a way that he is becoming an embryo. He is almost going back into that state, and this your attempt throughout this exhibition reminded me of that journey from the embryo uh, to the man, but also this man who is, or the, also this person who is anxious, who is also troubled, and who is also skeptical of what pathway to take, mm -hmm. and it's all of us, and that is why it becomes inviting for me to look at your works very carefully. The immense amount of references you bring in, the immense amount of possibilities you leave for us, and also the possibility of microcosm, which we think we can control, we can take care of it, but it also becomes a burden on us at times. It also becomes a device where you can drown yourself. You're thinking that that's a coping mechanism too. So that's all the exhibition for me is about, and it's a powerful, beautiful, poetic exhibition, and congratulations to you, you on that. Thank you. And